Good morning, scholars of Earth and environmental science. Today we will be learning about volcanoes and answering a number of questions. What are volcanoes? Where do they form? Why do they form where they do? Next, we will be looking at the different types of eruptions and the factors which affect them. After that, we will be learning about the material and landforms that emerge when volcanoes erupt. And then lastly, we will be learning about how volcanologists go about predicting eruptions. But the first question on everybody's mind is why should we care about volcanoes? First and foremost, volcanoes are evidence of the theory of plate tectonics. They, because they show us that Earth isn't this static object. It is dynamic, constantly changing and recreating its crust. Volcanoes also give us insight into the composition of the mantle. Volcanoes are destructive. They emit huge clouds of gas and these big destructive lava flows. And so we need to learn how to protect ourselves from the destruction of volcanoes. Volcanoes are also just awesome. They are awe-inspiring, gigantic, powerful, and many cultures around the world have associated them with mythological figures. For example, the Romans have a god, Vulcan, which is where we get our word volcano from. He is the Roman god of fire and the forge. Because so many people around the world have experience with volcanoes, they are also a cross-cultural phenomenon and gives us a space where we can relate to each other. But put simply, a volcano is an opening in the Earth's crust through which magma, gases, and ash can erupt. So there's a couple new words there. Magma, which is just rock that is so hot that it has turned to liquid. And there's ash, which is these very fine volcanic particles. We'll be exploring those in a bit more detail as we go through here. Let's first discuss the anatomy of a volcano. So deep underground is a magma chamber which is a reservoir of molten rock. And because liquid rock is less dense than the solid rock around it, buoyancy is going to cause magma in order to slowly move up over time and fill this magma chamber. The magma next flows through a conduit, which we see in the center of the volcano there, and sometimes out of side vents. And once the magma has left the volcano, we then call it lava, okay? So that's the key difference between magma and lava. Magma is underground, whereas lava is molten rock that has emerged from the ground. Lava just comes from the Italian word labes, meaning fall or slide. And this material is very hot. When lava comes out, it can be anywhere from 700 to 1200 Celsius, okay? Your oven doesn't even get that hot. Ovens only get around like 300 Celsius. So throughout this video, I'm going to ask you to stop and think. So on your notes or a separate sheet of paper, please answer these questions as we go throughout. So question one, where do you think volcanoes would be most likely to form? And question two, why do you think they would form there? So pause the video and take a few moments to ponder these questions and write out some answers. Okay, so let's address these questions now. So here we see a map of where volcanoes are around the world. So again, I would like you to stop and think and observe where these volcanoes form. And please describe any patterns that you notice. So the first thing that stands out to me is that this map is a little bit misleading. It shows a lot of volcanoes occurring on land, which there are a lot of volcanoes on land, over a thousand, but there are countless more beneath the ocean. These volcanoes also occur primarily along plate boundaries. And we see along the Pacific plate, there is a ring of fire. Okay? That region is very famous for having a lot of volcanoes and earthquakes around it. However, there are some notable exceptions to this trend. Some volcanoes form within plates, 
as we see um, the Hawaiian Islands and the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, those are inside of plates themselves. There are also some boundaries that lack volcanoes. If you look uh, just south of the Pacific Northwest in the region of California, we notice there that there aren't many volcanoes. Yeah? Remember back to when we discussed the different types of plate boundaries? That is the San Andreas Fault there, just to the west of California. And that is a transform boundary. So volcanoes, they do not form at transform boundaries. Instead, they form at divergent boundaries, some convergent boundaries, and then within plates. So we'll describe each of these in a bit more detail and why they happen. So at divergent boundaries, there is an opening in the crust which gives the magma an opportunity to flow out. And this happens due to a force called pressure. So we experience pressure every day in our lives. If you've ever been inside a pool before, you know that the water exerts a little bit of a force on you because there's the weight of water on top of you. Similarly, if you've been up high in the air, you know that the air pressure is lower there. That's why it's harder to breathe on the top of mountains and why your ears pop when you get inside of an airplane at high altitudes. So similarly, underground, due to the huge weight of the crust on top of it, this high pressure forces rocky material into a solid state. Even though the material in the asthenosphere is above the melting point, this high pressure forces the rock into a solid state. But what happens at divergent boundaries, there is less material at the fault. So if you have less material weighing down on top of you, that's less pressure. And because the material is at its melting point, it will then get an opportunity to melt and become magma. And because it is less dense, it is going to flow out and form volcanoes. Usually this happens along the ocean floor. Next, at convergent boundaries, volcanoes only form when there's an interaction with oceanic crust, okay? Remember, when continental and continental crust collide, we get folded mountains. So at these convergent boundaries, the oceanic crust will subduct under the continental crust because it is denser. When that happens, the friction of the subducting plate will heat up the nearby asthenosphere. In addition to heating it up, the introduction of water from sediments in oceanic crust that will turn to steam and lower the melting point of the rock. So these two effects will make it easier for the rock to melt despite the pressure below. And similarly, because magma is less dense than the solid rock, it will gradually float to the top and form volcanoes. So some examples of this. In the Pacific Northwest, there is a mountain chain called the Cascade Mountains. And these are formed as the result of the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate below the North American plate. And many of the famous American volcanoes can be found in this region. For example, this is a view of Mount Hood from the city of Portland, looking very majestic. And then here is a picture of Mount St. Helens after its famous eruption. And we see that huge depression form there from the explosion blowing away all of the material. Within plates, though, there is a controversy among geologists as to why volcanoes form within the plates. There are two competing theories as to why this happens. So the first theory, which is in line with the convection model of plate tectonics, the cracks in crust within the plates allow magma to come up there and create these volcanic chain islands. However, another theory says that plumes of extremely hot material emerge from the outer core and rise all the way up to the crust. This will heat up a local spot and cause magma to melt there locally. 
So as the plates move above that hot spot, this will create a volcanic island chain. We see this in the Hawaiian Islands. As the picture shows, the hot spot is theorized to be directly below the main island of Hawaii. Now that we've learned about where volcanoes form and why they form the way they do, let's now talk about the different types of volcanic eruptions. So eruptions are measured based on how explosive they are. On one side are the more quiet eruptions. These are the most common, and they have lots of lava flowing out from the volcano. This creates large areas of the Earth's surface, and the plumes that emerge from these volcanoes are not very tall. On the other hand, explosive eruptions are rare, but they can be very destructive. They release lots of hot debris, gas, and ash in big plumes that can rise miles high and this can potentially destroy the mountain itself. For example, in 1883, Krakatoa Island in Indonesia it was likely uh, responsible for creating the largest sound, sorry, the loudest sound in human history. This explosion was equivalent to a hundred and million tons of TNT, and this caused the about 18 cubic kilometers of material to be erupted into the air just a massive eruption. It's almost hard to kind of wrap your head around those numbers. So at this point, I'd like you to stop and think again and think about the factors that will affect how volcanoes erupt. So take a moment, please pause the video and think on this question. So there are three main factors which affect how eruptions go. There's the composition of the magma, the temperature of the magma, and the amount of gases that are dissolved in it. There can be up to 8% of the magma's total weight uh, in gas, which is dissolved, and that's usually going to be water and carbon dioxide, but to a smaller extent, you can find gases with sulfur and nitrogen in it. But the key concept that unites all of these factors is the idea of viscosity. You're likely very familiar with viscosity already. Think about different liquids like water and corn syrup or honey. Okay? We know that water, when we pour it from our pitcher, it flows pretty easily. Whereas honey, it's very sticky and takes a while to flow, has a very slow drip. We can explain this with the idea of viscosity, which is just how resistant a fluid is to motion. Okay? It's essentially measuring how much internal friction it has. So the more viscous a substance is, we need more force in order to get it to flow. And a big way to affect viscosity in liquids is that we can decrease the viscosity by increasing the temperature of something. So if you're trying to use honey in a recipe, it's a good idea to get a pot of hot water and submerge your honey inside of that. It'll make it a lot easier to flow. So let's go into a bit more detail about a couple of factors which affect how explosive an eruption is. The first one is how much silica is inside the magma. Silica is the compound silicon with two oxygens attached to it. It's also known as the mineral quartz. Okay? It is one of the most common materials in the Earth's surface. And what silica does, it can form these long rigid chains and crystals, which gives the material rigidity. And this rigidity is responsible, is responsible for the trend that as a magma has more silica, it will increase the viscosity. And with greater viscosity, the magma will flow slower, which can potentially plug up the vent of a volcano and gradually build up pressure over time for a big explosion. So more silica means more explosive. On the other hand, more dissolved water can also be responsible for more explosive eruptions. For this, Think about what happens when you open up a soda can. 
okay? You click the tab and gas comes hissing out. Well, why is that? In the soda factory, they package these sodas under very high pressure to dissolve as much carbon dioxide gas as they can. So the pressure holds in this dissolved gas. But when you open up the soda can, it equalizes with the pressure outside. And so the lower pressure on the soda is going to allow gas to escape. Similarly, water trapped in magma once it has risen to the surface and there's less crust on top of it, this exposure to lower pressure will cause gas to rapidly expand and burble out, causing very explosive eruptions. Okay? You should contrast this with quiet eruptions, which don't have as much gas con concentration, and so their lava flows are nice and smooth. So remember, Increase your silica content or increase your water content, that will create more explosive eruptions. So take a look here at these two pictures of lava flows. Okay? What do you notice? And then explain why you think these are different. So take a moment, pause the video. So depicted on the left, is a type of lava called aa, -a, which is a Hawaiian word for stony block lava. This is very viscous and it contains a lot of gas. And because it is so viscous, it is going to flow very slowly and form chunky rock as the gases escape. On the other hand, to the right, we see pahoihoi, which is a low viscous lava and it can flow out for miles as it cools and it forms these ropey, smooth texture to it. Okay? So viscosity plays a big deal in how lava cools and forms new rock. In addition to lava coming out of a volcano, you can get other types of material too. The main type of material is pyroclastic material. Pyro is the Greek word for fire, and clast is a word for fragments. So these fire fragments are classified based on how big they are. So the general trend, the bigger they are, the slower their cooling time. In addition, a flow called lahar also comes out of volcanoes. This is what happens when you mix some of these pieces of solidified magma with water and creates a very hot, very quickly moving volcanic mud flow. Okay? So pyroclastic material and lahar can be very dangerous. Okay? They're very destructive and can rush down the slope of a volcano at 120 kilometers per hour or more. And they can collide with structures, burn them, do all sorts of damage. So we'll talk more in detail about pyroclastic material. So when lava comes out of a volcano and solidifies, it can form particles of different sizes. The biggest particles, as you see on the right, are called bombs or blocks. That man is standing next to a block, and some of these blocks can weigh several tons. So when they hit structures, they can cause a significant amount of damage. On the left, at the top, we see small little stones called lapilli. These can also come from volcanoes, and they cool a little bit quicker than the larger blocks and bombs. And then lastly, is the most interesting type of pyroclastic material, in my own opinion. That is ash, which is just very, very fine particles of volcanic material. And ash forms whenever quickly expanding gas ruptures the magma and creates all these little very tiny fragments. And on one hand, ash can be very dangerous. It can get in the air and block out the sun, which can potentially cool the planet. An example of this is the Lakai eruption in 1783, which blocked out the sun, cooled the earth, and uh, caused droughts in various parts of the world. A lot of historians theorize that this was one major cause of the French Revolution in 1789. And if ash gets inside people's lungs, it can cause significant respiratory problems the very fine particles can rip your lungs apart. But on the other hand, 
ash can also be nourishing. It contains lots of very helpful nutrients, which can help fertilize the soil. So that's why a lot of agricultural products grow well in Hawaii. I would like you to stop and think again. So after looking at these three pictures of volcanoes, I would like you to write, what do you notice? And then explain why you think they're different. So go ahead and pause the video. So we'll explore each of these different types of volcanoes now. First of all, we have shield volcanoes. These are characterized by a very gradual slope, which is formed as less viscous lava runs out over very long distances. Okay? Many of these shield volcanoes are formed under the ocean, and some can get tall enough in order to break the surface of the water. Uh, for example, Skjaldbreithor, um, which means shield breaker in Icelandic, um, formed along the mid-Atlantic ridge. The Hawaiian Islands, um, one of which is Mauna Kea, is the tallest mountain in the world. It stands 10,000 meters high. That's, high. that's taller than Mount Everest. And this volcano, because of a lot of fertile land around it, was sacred to native Hawaiians. And a decision to build observatories there remains very controversial. A lot of people didn't like it that um, scientists built these observatories on top of the sacred region. So that would be something good to look into and to research for yourself and um, make an informed opinion about. Another type of volcano is a cinder cone. These are characterized with steeper sides that angle about 30 to 40 degrees, and these are usually made up of loose pyroclastic material. Okay, So bigger sediments instead of lava flows. And because the lava can't really make it out through the top of the vent, the lava comes out from the base. So these cinder cones are generally shorter, and they can form very, very quickly. For example, the Paricutin volcano in Mexico formed, it began in 1943 when some farmers noticed that a mountain suddenly sprung out of a cornfield. And it formed very quickly in just nine years. Some, most uh, cinder cone volcanoes can form in less than a year over just single or very few eruptions. It can also form on side vents of bigger volcanoes. So whereas cinder cone volcanoes are shorter, composite volcanoes are the big, majestic, awe-inspiring mountains, such as Mount Fuji near Tokyo and Mount Rainier in the Pacific Northwest near Seattle. These composite volcanoes, also called stratovolcanoes because they're so tall, they are formed by alternating layers of lava and pyroclastic material. They're steep and tall because their more viscous lava doesn't flow quite as far. Because their lava is more viscous, they generally have more explosive eruptions compared to shield volcanoes. In addition to the volcanoes themselves, Volcanic activity can form other types of landforms. At the top of volcanoes, we see a funnel-shaped pit called a crater. This small depression is formed as pyroclastic material gradually builds up over time, or when erosion caused by eruptions blows away part of the mountain itself. Bigger depressions are called calderas. These happen whenever a magma chamber collapses over time. This can result in, for example, the Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, it lost a huge amount of its height when it exhausted a lot of its magma chamber and then fell down into a caldera. Volcanic activity can also form plateaus. These are formed over millions of years as very, very thin, runny lava spreads out over large areas. This can form wide, flat landforms that can be very thick, up to several kilometers thick. Next up, this is what I think is the coolest effect of volcanoes. When volcanoes eject um, debris, the friction between this volcanic debris can create an imbalance of charges. 
And if that imbalance builds up enough, eventually the charge will be forced to move down to the ground and balance itself out. We see this effect as lightning, which is very impressive. We'll be exploring lightning a bit more when we get to our atmosphere unit. Next up, I would like you to stop and think again about how scientists could go about predicting when a volcano might erupt. So pause the video and think on this question. So before we can predict when volcanoes might erupt, we should be able to classify them based on their potential to erupt. This is characterized by what is the status of the magma chamber? how much magma is below the volcano. If the chamber is full and magma is moving up the conduit, then we say the volcano is active. It is either erupted recently or it is in the process of erupting. Volcanoes are considered dormant if their magma chamber is in the process of filling up. So dormant volcanoes can and potentially will erupt in the future. And finally, there are extinct volcanoes, which have exhausted their magma chamber and don't have the potential to fill up again, so they will very likely not erupt again. And we just see those as mountains, really. So there are four main methods that volcanologists use to predict when volcanoes might erupt. Firstly, earthquakes can be triggers for volcanic eruptions, as they can disrupt the plug which prevents magma from moving out. These can be detected using seismographs, which we'll talk more about in our next lecture, and earthquakes can precede eruptions. Next, volcanologists also use the ratios of different gases to predict when volcanoes might happen. Specifically, they calculate the ratio of sulfur dioxide to carbon dioxide. However, this is very dangerous work as these gases are quite hot poisonous. Next up, we know that when we heat up something, it can cause it to expand. We talked about this a little bit in erosion, and a similar effect happens here. The ground will swell up when the magma chamber fills, because the very hot magma will heat up the rock at the surface, causing it to expand. So scientists use satellites in order to measure the height of the ground nearby a volcano. Satellites can also detect infrared light emanating from the volcano. And this infrared imagery allows scientists to check um, to detect changes in temperature. So hotter temperatures might indicate that the magma chamber is filling and will potentially lead to an eruption soon. So this is the end of the video, and attached here are the main sources I used. We have the Holt Earth Science textbook, a very helpful YouTube video by Alexander Spahn. This helped me to learn a lot about volcanoes, and I suggest that you watch it. It goes into some great detail. And then lastly, if you're interested in learning about careers in earth science, there is a link to a podcast about a volcanologist. So next time we will be learning about earthquakes and I'll talk to you then.